Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for NACDL's webinar on criminal competencies. I'm Diane Price, the Indigent Defense Training Manager here at NACDL. I'm proud to be such a, a part of such an excellent group of attorneys whose mission is to ensure justice and due process for persons accused of crime, foster the integrity, independence, and expertise of the criminal defense profession, and promote the proper and fair administration of criminal justice. NACDL maintains a robust indigent defense reform and training program. The Indigent Defense Department provides training to public defenders and private assigned counsel nationwide, promotes indigent defense reform, and administers a scholarship program for indigent defenders to attend national CLE programs. We'd like to acknowledge the support of NACDL's members, the Foundation for Criminal Justice, and especially the Bureau of Justice Assistance, whose generous grant funding made today's program possible. As many of you watching know, the mental health of criminal defendants has been of increasing concern in recent years. Some studies estimate that as many as one in four defendants in the criminal justice system suffers from some sort of mental illness. Our speaker today is Michael Perlin, professor emeritus at New York Law School, who has written extensively on all aspects of mental disability law, including many books and articles that deal with the overlap between mental disability law and criminal law and procedure. Before becoming a professor, Mr. Perlin was the deputy public defender in charge of the Mercer County trial region in New Jersey, and for eight years was the director of the Division of Mental Health Advocacy in the New Jersey Department of the Public Advocate. He has represented thousands of persons with mental disabilities in individual and class actions, and has represented criminal defendants at every level from police court to the United States Supreme Court. Please welcome Michael Perlin. Diane, thank you very much, and it's really a pleasure for me to be here, and I hope everybody enjoys this program. Uh, we call this Competencies Plus, uh, which may be kind of an unusual title because I wanted to reinforce from the very beginning that there are multiple competencies. All too often, competency is seen as simply a question of competence, competency to stand trial and maybe competency to go pro se or maybe waiving counsel. But there is much more than that. And this brief description loses sight of the multiple other criminal competencies that defense lawyers need to keep in mind at all times. And we're going to be exploring those later today during this webinar. Now, why are we talking about competency? Well, even though the insanity defense is the lightning rod of media ire, I looked at my email yesterday, there were three letters from people, one from NPR and two from uh, journalists in Colorado wanting my views on the insanity defense in light of the, the Holmes case there. Uh, people are preoccupied with it kind of obsessively, but scholars and practicing lawyers agree that questions of criminal competency are numerically at least far more important to the criminal justice system than are insanity questions. Uh, snapshot, in a typical year, 60,000 criminal defendants have incompetency to stand trial hearings. That figure is not exact. There are no exact numbers. That's the best we can do. And about 20% of those defendants are found to be incompetent to stand trial at least once. So this is significant. But again, these issues have never really been on the radar screen in the same way, with the same urgency that insanity defense questions have. Very often, incompetency determinations are done quietly with little fanfare. They're usually the defendants who are found incompetent to stand trial are usually more disabled than insanity defendants and less likely to have committed the kinds of high visibility crimes that make tabloid headlines. There's really any, rarely any testimony about the crime itself at an incompetency hearing. So there's very little for the media to jump onto. And most importantly, raising the incompetency status is in no way a concession that the defendant committed the underlying criminal act. Uh, it's a status, it's not a defense. I tell my students every year, let's assume I'm charged with a crime and let's assume on that day I have a rock solid alibi those of you who know me know I'm a Bob Dylan fan, so I'll use that, that I'm on the Jumbotron at a Dylan concert, date stamped in a different state at that time. But on, my way to tr on the way to the courthouse, a cinder block falls off a building and hits me on the head, rendering me mentally disabled. My lawyer pleads me in uh, raises 
the incumbency status, asks for a hearing. I am no more guilty of that crime than I was the minute before the cinder block hit me. Yet everybody, when I say everybody, I mean defense lawyers, prosecutors, judges, and expert witnesses believe that once the incompetency status is raised, that's a concession of guilt. It's not. When you raise the insanity defense, you say, yes, I did it, but I did it to protect us from the Klingon Empire or whatever. Incompetency status is not that. And if we come, if I'm, I'm able to share one thing today, if anyone did not know that, that's about as important as anything there is to talk about. So what's the roadmap? Uh, in the first part, and this is after the first presentation, this is part one, there's going to be a five minute break. Uh, the first part is on competency to stand trial. I'll be talking about substantive standards. I'll be talking about procedural standards. I'll be talking about post-determination commitments and ask the question, is Jackson versus Indiana, the United States Supreme Court's 1972 case, that's really the lodestar of everything that's happened in the last 42 years, is it taken seriously in many states? I'm also going to throw out a curveball. What's the potential impact of the Americans with Disabilities Act? Those of you who are full-time public defenders don't do any civil practice. Many of the rest of you are expect most of your practice is criminal law. And maybe you haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the ADA. But I believe the ADA potentially has great impact on competency to stand trial post-determination commitments. And I want to talk about that. I'm going to talk about medication issues, which are at the core of this whole area. And I'm going to talk a little bit about restoration issues, and then again, some others. So that's all part one. Part two, I'm going to be talking about two major competency questions. Competency to plead guilty and competency to go pro se. When we talk about competency to plead guilty, I'm going to want you to think about the difference between defendants with psychosocial disabilities, what we call mental illness, and those with intellectual disabilities, what we used to call mental retardation. When we talk about competence to go pro se, we have to think about a very, very important question, and I'm going to be talking about these cases later on this morning. Did the United States Supreme Court case of Indiana versus Edwards in 2008 really only, quote, modify its 1993 decision of Godinez versus Moran, as the Supreme Court said it did, or is it something more? Question one. Question two. Is being standby counsel in the pro se case of a defendant of questionable competence better or worse than having root canal without anesthesia? Uh, I've been standby counsel in those cases, and it was not a pretty sight. And then, and we're going to really be talking about this uh, for the final, part three of the presentation, what is the scope of Godinez and what, how far does it go? Does it apply only to trial or does it apply to pre-trial or to post-trial as well? And there's some very interesting language in the just, a, a concurrence by Justice Kennedy and Scalia as to its scope, very rarely discussed, but I think, and this is going to be the whole last third of my talk, there are all these other competencies that we need to think about and we need to figure out, does Godinez control or does Godinez not control? When I talk about these competencies, pre-trial, at trial, and post-trial, this is going to be a little of this and a little of that. I'm going to be talking about consenting to search, to lineups, and preliminary hearings, and note that I am not talking at all about the question of competency to be executed, the Supreme Court has talked about that twice in Ford versus Wainwright, 1984, and Panetti versus Quarterman in 2007. Excuse me. Many of the issues are still open. That's certainly worthy of a webinar on its own. I'm speaking to the NACDL managers now, but we're, I'm not talking about that. I'm also not going to be talking about confessions, and there are two important cases in the 80s Colorado v. Connolly and Wainwright versus Greenfield, because my expectation is that those are covered in other confessions programs. So we start with pretrial. We then go to, uh, we then go from there to trial issues directly, 
questions of waiving juries, questions of evidentiary objections, questions of statements to the media. And then look at people who are not your clients, competence of jurors, competence of witnesses to testify. Also, importantly, the impact of incompetency on a defendant's ability to enter an NGRI or a GBMI guilty but mentally ill plea. This very often goes totally under the radar, but it's there and it is certainly something that's worth considering. And then uh, beyond that, we have the post-trial issues. I realized I had the, I'm sorry, here we go, the post-trial issues of questions of sentencing, questions, motions for a new trial, appeals, post-conviction relief, probation violations, parole revocation hearings. And then even beyond that, there are some others I may get to mention if I have a moment. This is going to be at the very end. Extradition cases, SVPA hearings, Sexually Violent Predator Act hearings. And I know that in 40% of the states there are SVPA statutes. So in your states, this is something that's going to be coming up. And there's very, very little law on it. I think as time goes on, this is going to grow is in importance. Okay, so what are the historical roots? We'll do just a little bit of history. There are really very few principles that are as firmly embedded in Anglo-American criminal jurisprudence as the doctrine that an incompetent defendant can't be put to trial. The doctrine is generally traced back to 17th century England, although it goes way before that. There's there's allusions to it in the Code of Justinian. There's allusions to it in the Talmud. So this is not anything that is new. But the, do the doctrine as we know it goes back to 17th century Eng uh, England. And the commentators at that time talked about first the fact that an incompetent defendant could not aid in his defense. So we're going back almost 500 years to the notion that if a defendant can't assist counsel. That's the most important issue to think about in determining his competency. There was a historic ban, number two, on trials in absentia, and they said a defendant who wasn't competent to stand trial was like trying somebody in absentia. And number three, uh, they made parallels back then to cases of defendants who simply refused to plead to charges that were leveled against them. So what's the early black letter law? Pretty clear. The trial and conviction of a person who is mentally and physically incapable of making a defense violates what were called certain immutable principles of justice that inhere in the idea of free government. So this is kind of a star-spangled banner, stars and stripes forever rather, of obligato, inhering in the idea of a free government. And these are cases that date back to 1906 and 1910. This has always been seen as extraordinarily important in the American legal system. What was the early black letter law here? Well, again, one, the incompetent defendant might alone have exculpatory information that he might not be able to tell his lawyer. And what's the lawyer gonna do if he or she can't find that out? Number two, early cases say to try an incompetent defendant has been likened uh, in, to, to permitting an adversary contest, quote, in which the defendant, like a small boy being beaten by a bully, this is pretty florid, is unable to dodge or to return the blows. Uh, number three, that the trial of an incompetent defendant transforms the adversary process into an invective against an insensible object. I wince at that because I never like to see my, think of my clients as an object, but these are the way the cases back before the 1950s, used to refer to, to, to these processes. And said finally, it is essential to the philosophy of punishment that a defendant knows why he is being punished. And that's to a great extent dependent on the defendant's involvement with the trial itself. So these four reasons were always the ones that were listed as the reasons as to why we need an incompetency to stand trial doctrine. Early cases, courts adopted the common law test. Does the mental impairment of the prisoner's mind disable him from making his, fairly presenting his defense and make it unjust to go on with a trial at this time 
or is he feigning that condition? And I should have probably underscored and highlighted in yellow the word feigning, because one of the things that I think is really important to think about in this whole area of law and social policy are the court's irrational fear of faking. Go through the cases and see how often you see feigning, faking, malingering, raised every time. I don't think Justice Scalia has ever written an opinion in this case, in, in this area of the law, without raising that specter. Uh, we know that it actually happens very rarely, rarely, and that good expert witnesses can ferret it out very quickly because most people fake very badly. But that's one of the major points. We are in thrall to that fear of faking, fear of feigning, and I think it's something that needs to be kept in mind. Of uh, the first important United States Supreme Court case here is the case of Dusky versus the United States, decided in 1960. And Dusky says the question is this. Did the defendant have sufficient present ability to consult with his lawyer with a reasonable degree of rational understanding? And does he have a rational as well as a factual understanding of the proceedings against him? So it's got two tiers. Consult with lawyer and know what's going on in the proceedings, and that the understanding has to be both rational and it has to be factual. And I think that's extraordinarily important to keep both of these in mind. Uh, what's interesting about Dusky is that the Dusky opinion is basically two paragraphs. It was per curiam. It was never argued. In fact, most of this comes from the Solicitor General's brief. The, I was going to say the Supreme Court cut and pasted it, but back in 1960 there were no computers, but they probably did it with the scissors. This is basically the, the Solicitor General's opinion in the Dusky case in his brief, and the Supreme Court adopts it. Remarkably, 55 years after Dusky is decided, this standard has not been modified at all. And then that's kind of extraordinary. I can't think of another criminal law doctrine, except maybe uh, Johnson versus Zerps from 38 on, on waiver, in which the Supreme Court has stayed with a case that preceded the, Warren the Earl Warren Revolution. It's still there, and that's something I think everybody should keep in mind. What does a defendant have to do? He has to be able to communicate. He has to be able to reason from a simple premise to a simple conclusion. He has to be able to recall and re I'm sorry. Recall and relate facts concerning his actions. He has to have the ability to comprehend instructions and advice. He has to be able to make decisions based on well-explained alternatives. The other important piece of, of, of Dusky, as I've already said, it emphasizes rationality. He doesn't simply have to know he was arrested, he is in jail, they say he committed a robbery. He has to be able to apprise the proceedings, he has to be able to assess the proceedings. That goes way beyond simple factual understanding, and I'm going to come back to that later on, because when we get to the last part of this and talk about restoration of competency, we see how many restoration programs are learning by rote. Does the defendant know there's a judge in the courtroom? Does the defendant know there's a jury? Blah, blah. Get to that later. Dusky goes way beyond that. And so many of the restoration programs currently in place ignore that. So, Dusky is supplemented in 1975, 15 years later, by Dropey versus Missouri. Now, Dropey also requires that a defendant be able to assist in his, de is his defense, but there is much more to Dropey besides that. Dropey says, there are no fixed or immutable signs that invariably indicate the need for further inquiry. In other words, these are difficult questions. There's a wide range of manifestations and subtle nuances. I was a practicing public defender for years. Subtlety is not always number one on the court's agenda. I know that. But Dropey tells us we have to be aware of this kind of 
of subtlety. And these can be very, very difficult questions for judges to analyze. So this says basically that the defense counsel has a heightened role in a dropey situation to alert the court to what's going on with her client, to alert the court as to what the client may or may not be doing that might make her incompetent to stand trial. Evidence of irrational behavior, demeanor at trial, prior medical opinion, these are all relevant. Now the court says there are no fixed or immutable signs that invariably signal the need for a further hearing. The question is a difficult one. What this saying is there is more weight on your shoulders as defense lawyers to see if any of these signals are, are there. Uh, and I think that's very, very important to keep in mind. The other point is, and this is so important, unlike other criminal pleas, the prosecutor, the DA, cannot say this defendant is pleading insanity. Can't be done. Has to be up to the defendant. But Dropey makes it very clear that the question of incompetency can be raised sua sponte by the court or by the prosecutor as well as by defense counsel. It underscores the point I tried to make earlier. There is no relationship between incompetency and guilt. Now it's interesting. Those of you who were fans of the original TV show Law and Order, I was, it, it always struck me that Mike McCoy, the Sam Waterston's role, uh, filed what are called 730s in New York, which are requests for an incompetency evaluation more than all the other DAs I knew in the world put together. And several years ago, I did a talk at uh, the American Psychology Law Society, and I said that. I said, I'm curious, has anybody in this room ever been in a case in which the DA has asked for an incompetency hearing? And to my amazement, three people raised their hand. I said, wow, where are you from? Hamilton County, Ohio. Where are you from? Hamilton County, Ohio. Where are you from? Hamilton County, Ohio. Uh, in that county, that's Cincinnati, the DA would do it regularly. I believe it is very, very rare. Although, interestingly, it might be a very good gambit for prosecutors in some cases, for reasons we'll, not a good gambit, but a gambit that we'll explore later. Uh, but that's something to keep in mind. It can be raised by the DA, and it can be raised by the court. Okay, so what are the factors that the court needs to consider, I'm sorry again, uh, in an incompetency case? Uh, I'm quoting here from a case called People versus Pocotzi, a New York case from 30 years ago, but you know, it was the lead case in 1989 when I first wrote about it. It was still the lead case in 2002 when I wrote about it again. I wrote about it last week. It's still seen as the lead case, so I think you can go with this one because it asks half a dozen questions, and I think no matter what state you're in, these six questions are a good cheat sheet for you to have by you at your side. Is the defendant oriented as to time and place? Can he or she, and I say he or she, in 90% of incompetency defendants are male, but uh, there are a few more women now than there used to be. Is he able to perceive, recall, and relate? Does he have an understanding of the process of the trial, the roles of the judge, the jury, the prosecutor, and the defense attorney? Can he establish a working relationship with his attorney? Does he have enough intelligence and judgment to listen to counsel's advice and based on that advice, appreciate without necessarily adopting, look at those words, appreciate without necessarily adopting the fact that one course of conduct may be more beneficial to him than another. And then finally, is he sufficiently stable to withstand the stresses of trial without suffering serious prolonged or permanent breakdown? I actually litigated that case once. I had a client who in my office was fine. My office was then, the PD's office was across the street from the courthouse, and I would watch him deteriorate as we crossed the street. By the time we got to the courthouse steps, he was a mess. And my expert witness said he was situationally competent. And the judge said, what does that mean? That's not New Jersey law. And he said, well, if we clear the courtroom, other than the person who's testifying, if we have many breaks, and he added a few other uh, suggestions, he would be competent to stand trial. I thought that was great. Uh, very few, I had a wonderful judge, very few lawyers raise issues like that, but I think that really goes to the sixth point 
in the Bacozzi case. All right. What does a defendant have to be able to do? I've already said this, I think. Communicate, be able to reason from a simple premise to a simple conclusion, and recall and relate facts about his actions, comprehend instructions and advice, and make decisions based on well-explained alternatives. Your client is not always going to agree with you. Your client will say, I'm going to testify no matter the fact that I have a 17-page rap sheet, or I don't want to testify, even though I'm the only person who might have evidence that would exculpate me. It's happened to all of us. But here, he has to have that ability. It's not, do you, as the lawyer, agree that it's the right decision? Is he making this decision in a way that shows comprehension of the court process. So let's look there. So that, was, that goes all to the substantive question of, of standing trial. How about the procedural issues? Well, the Supreme Court decided a case called Pate v. Robinson in 1966. And again, nearly 50 years later, that is still the law. And this is the first important procedural case. Conviction of a person who is mentally incompetent violates due process. And if there is a bona fide doubt as to the defendant's competence, the trial judge must raise the issue on his own and weigh it at a suitable hearing, safeguarded with procedures that are adequate to permit the judge as trier of fact to reasonably assess the accused competency against, quote, prevailing medical and legal standards. And that's very interesting because medical standards have changed a lot in the last 50 years. And we've grown, those of you who are familiar with DSM, that's the, uh, d the, the manual that psychiatrists use. When I started practicing criminal defense lawyer, it was DSM-2, then 3, then 3R, then 4, then 4 revised, now it's 5. Medical standards have changed a lot. And one of the issues here is the extent to which the court is aware of that. Those of you representing defendants with mental disabilities always need to keep all of this in mind. Now, there have been many interpretations of Pate of is the defendant, uh, is, it, is the doubt substantial? Is it sufficient? Is it clear and unequivocal? Is it real and substantial? Uh, many, many different phrases. It's used, you know, in, in, in many, many different ways. Uh, is there a reasonable doubt as to whether or not the defendant is fit to stand trial? Important, note well, mental illness is alone is not enough. And there are dozens and dozens of cases, probably in the hundreds, in which courts have found that certain handicapping, disabling conditions were not a sufficient predicate for a finding of incompetency. Severe mental illness, a cumulative history of neurological and physiological ailments, a history of hospitalization, a finding of dangerousness, organic brain function, dysfunction, a history of diagnoses of paranoid and schizophrenia, uh, on and on. Uh, one of, at the very end, in the last couple of slides of the, the final uh, set of slides, uh, is, a is a bibliography of, 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 of sources. And one of the things that I've put on, I've done a treatise on mental disability law, and in volume three, chapter eight, I laundry list all these cases. And it's, you know, it's pretty much a very sobering list to see the levels of serious mental disability in which judges have said, I don't care, he's competent anyway. I mean, don't take that as a reason to not raise it, but I'm just you know, offering that to you as something that in fact may be there. Okay, now, what about the burden of proof? Well, in 1992, in a California case called Medina versus California, the Supreme, in, in Medina, and I had practiced uh, all my criminal defense work in New Jersey where the burden was on the state, but California placed the burden on the defendant by a preponderance. And the court said that is not unconstitutional, that this allocation does not, quote, offend some principle of justice so rooted in the traditions and conscience of our people as to be ranked as fundamental. And you know that many, many times in constitutional law considerations, the Supreme Court will look at that, is it so rooted in the traditions and conscience of our people, and say, well, no, it's not. Who knows? 
Uh, the point is the Supreme Court was willing in Medina to allow this statute to be upheld. A very interesting dissent by Justice Blackmun. This is not the first time you're going to hear me use the words a dissent by Justice Blackmun, because in the 1980s and the 1990s, Justice Blackmun's dissents were, I believe, the most important Supreme Court decisions in this er area, opinions in this area. He says, the right to be tried while competent is the foundational right for the effective exercise of all other criminal trial process rights. And he says, look at this. If the evidence is in total homeostasis, 50% competent, 50% incompetent, the defendant loses. So because the burden is on him. So what this countenance is, is a trial of a defendant about which half the evidence says he's incompetent to stand trial. And Blackman says, that's too much for me. Now, on the question of burden of proof, the court decided in another case four years later called Cooper versus Oklahoma. Oklahoma was one of, I believe, four states that placed the burden on the defendant to disprove competency by clear and convincing evidence. None of us know what clear and convincing evidence really means, right? Uh, I do civil work a lot, as Diane told you, on, on behalf of mental patients, and the uh, standard of proof in civil commitment hearings the Supreme Court decided in 1979 in a case called Addington versus Texas was clear and convincing. It's a tweener. Uh, it's not preponderance. It's not 50.01%, and it's not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's somewhere in between and it's never really well defined. 67% to 75%, yeah, maybe. But here, what's happening is the Supreme Court is putting the burden, I'm sorry, the Oklahoma legislature is putting the burden on the defendant to disprove by clear and convincing evidence. And the court says, no, that statute is unconstitutional. Competence to stand trial is rudimentary, for upon it depends the main part of those rights that are deemed essential to a fair trial. Boy, this sounds so much like Justice Blackmun's dissent in Medina. The right to summon, to confront, and to cross-examine witnesses. The right to testify or to remain silent without penalty. Uh, both uh, traditional and modern practice agrees that the state could not put on trial a defendant who may have demonstrated it was more likely than not that he was incompetent. So that's Cooper. Again, only four states. Its significance, though, I believe, is that the Supreme Court tardily, and of course without ever acknowledging it, realized that black men had the better part of the philosophical discussion in Medina. Okay. So that basically concludes part one on the procedural issues. We now move on to part two. Two and the rest of the first session, which will probably go about another 20 minutes or so. Excuse me. I guess not. <laughs> we do have a question go. from a public defender in Virginia um, asking that procedurally, if the court has determined the defendant to be competent after two competency evaluations and a hearing, but counsel still has concerns regarding competency, should the issue be raised with the court again? If so, how and when? I think yes. I, well, I guess there's a question. Is it simply that the counsel disagrees with the finding or is there kind of new evidence? Has the defendant been acting in ways that were not covered by the first opinions, the first psychiatric opinions? I'd like to know that. I don't have the answer to that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> when that person responds, oh no. Uh, but we're going to be talking about for the rest of this first piece are dispositional issues. In other words, a person is found incompetent to stand trial, what then? And this I'm dividing into three parts. What happened before Jackson versus Indiana was decided, Jackson versus Indiana, and after Jackson. Warning, war story coming up. I'm going to talk to you about a case I did after Jackson versus Indiana was decided and sort of how it affected the practice in this area in the state of New Jersey and eventually in other jurisdictions. So that's, that's coming. Traditionally, 
before Jackson, a finding of incompetency led to a long-term or very often a permanent commitment to the maximum security wing of a state hospital. Uh, in, in Massachusetts, a study was done in the 70s that said more incompetent defendants left Bridgewater Hospital in Massachusetts by dying than by all other avenues combined. And that is very, very typical of how most states were until the early 1970s. There are stories of defendants that sound anecdotal, but trust me, are not, who had been institutionalized for over 50 years awaiting trial. What they showed was that the lawyers representing them were stymied. It showed the courts didn't care. And it showed that the objections to the procedures were not simply theoretical objections, but they were really grounded in real life. Think about all of these other perils in the procedure. Delay, disappearing witnesses, increased frustration, anxiety, greater stigmatization. These impose additional liabilities on the defendant who's incompetent to stand trial. When I was a rookie public defender, my hair was jet black at the time. It was a long time ago. I was assigned is kind of rookie hazing. Uh, I was assigned to do the cases at the New Jersey Room Building. That was the maximum security facility for the criminally insane. The hearings were all, and the only hearings I did were if someone had the wherewithal to get an eight cent stamp and send me a letter, they would have a habeas corpus hearing. No regular hearings were scheduled. So the people who I was representing were really the highest functioning of the patients. I would get, the same 20 people would write me letters every month. I knew there were a couple of hundred people there, but I had no idea who they were, how to find them. And basically, there are only two important questions that the Attorney General asked the, the state psychiatrist. Doctor, does Mr. Jones have a mental illness? Yes. Would Mr. Jones benefit from treatment in the hospital? Yes. Brackets. That assumed a fact not in evidence that he was getting treatment at the hospital, but that's for a later time. And of course, I lost every single one of those cases. Keep that in mind. That happened before Jackson versus Indiana was decided. So what does Jackson say? 1972 case, and Jackson is the grandfather of all institutional mental disability law, civil and criminal. And it's an extraordinarily important case to know about. Jackson says that the long-term indeterminate commitment of an individual based solely on his incompetence to stand trial violates the Constitution. So what are the facts of the Jackson case? Jackson was a person with a severe intellectual disability, almost an unmeasurably low IQ. He was deaf, he was mute. He was incapable of reading, he was incapable of writing. He had a very limited knowledge of sign language, but it was really very rudimentary. He's charged with two counts of robbery. They were basically purse snatches from porches involving less than $10 worth of goods. He pled not guilty. He was examined by two state doctors who agreed he was unable to understand the nature of the charges against him or participate in his defense. And an interpreter who tried to, try to help along said that Indiana had no facilities that could help somebody as badly off as Jackson who had to help him learn some minimal communication skills. That's the facts. So what does the trial judge do? The trial judge orders him committed to the State Department of Mental Health. Note, there was never any evidence as to mental illness. Quote, until such time as that department should certify to the court that the defendant is sane. Where does sanity have to do with this case? Answer, nothing. But that's what happened. Jackson's lawyer then files a motion for a new trial, saying there was no evidence that he was insane. True. There was no evidence he would ever regain, attain a status that the court might regard him as, quote, sane, if that is to be interpreted as competent to stand trial, and that basically this commitment was a life sentence without conviction, that it was proscribed by the Equal Protection Clause, by the Due Process Clause, and by the Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause. Jackson loses throughout the, uh, the, the Indiana state system, and he goes to the United States Supreme Court. In a unanimous decision, it was seven to zero, 
This was a time two were going, two were coming, so it was only a seven-person court, but it was unanimous. There are two separate holdings by the Supreme Court, an equal protection holding and a due process holding. And what the Supreme Court did was it looked at the facility that Jackson was being kept at and it compared it to the facilities that a person like Jackson might have gone to had he not been involved in the criminal process in terms of difficulty or ease of getting out, in terms of reviews, in terms of ability to have civil rights while you're institutionalized. And the court said that it was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Very, very few cases in criminal justice in the last 30, 40 years have been based on the Equal Protection Clause. This one was to subject an incompetent to stand trial defendant to a more lenient commitment standard and a more stringent release standard than generally applicable to those who had never been charged with offenses, thus condemning him in effect to permanent institutionalization. And the court went beyond that and said, it is a violation of the due process clause to commit an individual for more than the quote, reasonable period of time to determine whether there is a, and these words should also be underscored in yellow highlight, substantial chance, substantial chance of his attaining the capacity to stand trial in the foreseeable future. There's more. If it were to be determined that the defendant would not regain his competence within the foreseeable time, and this is the first time the word foreseeable shows in any criminal procedure U.S. Supreme Court case, then the state must either institute the customary civil commitment proceedings that would be required to commit any other citizen or release the defendant. And then further, the court said, even if it were determined that the defendant probably would be able to stay in trial, continued commitment must be justified by progress towards that goal. The Supreme Court said we're not going to set a finite time limit on what a reasonable length of time is. Jackson had been in for three and a half years. The court says that establishes a lack of substantial probability. So once you're in there for three and a half years and a day, without it being probable you're going to stand trial, on paper, underscore that on paper, you're in violation of Jackson. In the Jackson decision, there's a fascinating, written by Justice Blackmun, of course, a fascinating line that says something like this. Given the number of persons subject to involuntary hospitalization, it is surprising that so few cases have been brought before us. And this was the absolute hit your head with your hand and go, oh my God. Because as you know, the Supreme Court is always whining, and, and the liberals and the conservatives are all the same. We're too busy, too many cases, blah, blah, blah. Here, Justice Blackmun is saying, come on down, boys and girls, the candy store is open. We want to do more cases like this. And that line is probably as important to the development of mental disability law slash criminal procedure than any other line, even though it's not the holding of a case. It's ultimate dicta than anything else that's ever, that's ever been written. And see, keep that in mind. So, well, this all sounds great, but what happened after Jackson? The story is not a great story. There are still, today, 2015 significant implementation and enforcement gaps. Within seven years of Jackson, states all reviewed their statutes, but by 1985, half the jurisdictions ignored it. They still permitted indefinite hospitalization based on continuing incompetency to stay in trial, often in the worst facility in the state. And my friend, the late Bruce Winnick, who I believe was a member of NACDL, wrote about that first in 1985. I have citations here because I want you to see sort of the arc and the timeline. I'm also going to go back to the story that I started before when I was doing these cases at the Vroom Building. I read Jackson. I realized that many of my clients had been there for much more than three and a half years. And I did something which only the bravado and the nerve of a 25-year-old rookie public defender could do, I guess. I filed a class action against the state called Dixon versus Cahill. Cahill was the governor. He was a very nice man, but I had to sue somebody to say 
that New Jersey was not in compliance with Jackson. We wound up settling for about 99% of what I'd asked for. And then the judge said, you know, Mr. Perlin, you've done such a good job on the class action. I'm now appointing you to represent every one of these people in their individual hearings. You know, good work is its own reward. There were 225 people at the Broom Building. Some had been in. Leroy Dixon, who was my, my lead plaintiff, had been there for about four or five years. He was in the back seat in a, joy, in a joyriding case. That was his crime. Uh, there were, uh, some were homicides, some were very, very negligible cases. Uh, there had been people who had been there since 1958, 1948, 1938, and one case, State versus Harrison Noel, since 1928 without a hearing. This was 1974, so 50 years, just about. Uh, and when the dust cleared, and I had done all 225 cases, the court determined, this was a very conservative by the books judge, this was not, you know, kind of an ACLU trained judge by any means, uh, 185 of the 225 people were there illegally. And that profoundly changed the way that forensic practice happened in New Jersey and had a collateral effect in many of the nearby states. Uh, well, I just told you about the 1985 research. What happened after that? Well, in 1993, Grant Morris and uh, Reed Malloy uh, researched it again and found that 20 years after Jackson, 1993, 30 statutes and the, 30 states and the District of Columbia still had not statutorily revised their laws to comply with Jackson. 23 jurisdictions did not address it at all. So in other words, Jackson was ignored in nearly half the states. So following that, in 2000, I wrote an article about this. There was virtually no change. And then as recently as 2012, three forensic psychiatrists did research, published their research in the Journal of the American Academy of Psychiatry and Law, which is a great source uh, for, for much of the data in this. And they said most states were still out of compliance with Jackson. So that's something to think about. And we don't have time now to really talk about it, but think about why. Imagine another Supreme Court case from 1972 that half the states chose to ignore 40 years later and nobody cares about and nobody knows about. Uh, professors Morris and Malloy called their article Out of Mind, Out of Sight. And I thought that was a brilliant title because that really tells you the story. People were locked away and nobody cared. And one of my, the reasons I'm so happy that I'm doing this webinar today is to talk to those public defenders and other lawyers out there who do these cases to say there's certainly a good chance that your jurisdiction doesn't comply with Jackson and now would be a great time to stop that. Okay, so what about uh, the next thing I want to talk about? I remember I, I mentioned the ADA. I'm not going to talk about this a lot, but I think it's pretty important. There's some background here. Trial judges believed, half of trial judges, four years after Jackson believed, that if somebody was found incompetent to stand trial, they had to be sent to the maximum security facility no matter whether the charge was murder one or whether the charge was drunken disorderly. In other words, that was the only place they could go. And we found that about 90 percent of all judges felt that hospitalization was the only choice that could be, uh, could be made. Supreme Court decided an ADA case in 1999 called Olmstead versus LC. And I believe if Olmstead is taken seriously, it can cause a major reconceptualization of all these policies. Because policies like that, that send the person charged with a triple murder to the same maximum security facility as the person charged with possession of a joint or peeing on the sidewalk or whatever, and it is that way in many states, may violate the ADA under the terms of Olmstead. It doesn't take into account the severity of the defendant's crime. It doesn't take into account his degree of current dangerousness. 
it doesn't take into account the severity of his mental illness. And I think individual, after Olmsted, individualized determinations have to be made as to whether or not that kind of maximum security uh, treatment is necessary. Many people could be treated in facilities much less restrictive than the maximum security forensic facility, and Olmsted, I think, says it's no longer permissible under federal constitutional law to continue these other policies. Olmsted says unjustified isolation, and that's what's happening here, is properly regarded as discrimination based on disability. Undue institutionalization is discrimination by reason of disability. There is nothing in Olmsted that suggests that its holdings are limited to civil patients. I've spoken about this at other seminars. I know that in the state of Washington, uh, one of the lawyers in the Disability Rights Office brought a class action and she was successful in Washington changing its policies. I've heard word on the street that a few others have, but still this is not honored in most states. Olmsted is now 15 years old. I think the time is right for criminal defense lawyers to start reading Olmsted, taking it seriously, and filing motions in, uh, for those of you in those states where everybody is still sent to a maximum security facility. So I, I would hope you would think about doing that. Okay, it's about 10 minutes to 11. We're going to take a five-minute break now. Uh, when we come back, we are going to talk about medication issues, which are the most important issues, I believe, in determining who is going to be restored to competency to stay in trial. And when we finish that, we're going to move on to the rest of the material. If any of you have any questions, that would be a good time so far after we take our break. I'll take them before we start again. Thank you. The video feed is going to disconnect during this break, and you'll be able to join back in five minutes.